sometimes when we read the Bible, I feel like we think about the, the people kind of as like story characters. Uh, and it can be hard to imagine them as real men and women. But the truth is, like, when we read the Gospels, we're reading it about people who lived and walked on this earth. That's something that even even people who, uh, like, don't identify with a religion um, or, like, don't believe in Jesus, don't believe in God, whatever, no one can dispute the fact that Jesus was a real dude. Like, Jesus existed. He is in, like, so many books and so many writings, like, historical writings across the globe. Like, and everyone agrees that he was here from this time to this time. Like, these are real people. Everyone can agree with that. And, like, sometimes we don't, like, simply have to, like, take this on faith. Again, there's historical evidence that Jesus and his disciples walked this earth and preached over 2,000 years ago. The men and women that we read about in the Bible are just as real as me and you. And if you visit Rome, like you can walk the streets where St. Peter and St. Paul walked and were preaching the gospel, like the first disciples. I'm going to read a passage from Mark that like, I want you to imagine that you're one of the disciples in this. And it's not simply like a, a story or a storybook character, but these are normal human beings. I was going to open this up, but then that game turned into chaos. So bear with me for a minute as I get open. I'm going to read Mark 1, 16 through 20. If you want to follow along, Mark 1, 16 through 20. This is called The Call of the First Disciples. As he passed by the Sea of Galilee, he is in Jesus, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting their nets into the sea. They were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. Then they left their nets and followed him. He walked along a little farther and saw James, son of Zebedee, and his father, his brother John. They too were in a boat mending their nets. Then he called them. So they left their father Zebedee in the boat along with the hired men and followed him. What do you what do you notice about these men? Like what makes these seemingly ordinary fishermen extraordinary? Genuinely, if you have thoughts. Over here. Yeah. Because they kind of just followed Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, they, they just dropped everything and followed them. That's crazy. Yeah, what were you going to say? Nothing. Nothing? No, oh, they're extraordinary. They're not, nothing makes them any different from anyone else. Okay. Yeah, I, I actually, yeah, I like that point. I mean, I thought of them that day. There was one, I probably was like, no, random guy just came up to me and followed me. Right, that kind of sends up some red flags normally, but, but this is Jesus. Like, when you meet Jesus, like, you know something is different about this dude. You know, like, immediately that you can trust him. And I think you make an excellent point that, yeah, these are just normal men. Like, we can think about them as, like, oh, well, like, they're saints or whatever. Like, they're they're super holy, so they saw Jesus and they could just drop everything and follow him. They were normal dudes. They were just fishing. But when they encountered Jesus, they dropped everything. And, like, that's wild. That's amazing. And, like, where were you imagining yourself in this story? Like if you were if you were there, if you were watching this happen, would you watch them and think like, that's crazy, you guys don't even know this guy? Like, did you think about the fact that fishing was their livelihood? This was their job. This is just what they did. That they had family and friends. It says that two of them literally left their father in the boat 
You're just like, he's bad. I'm going to go follow Jesus. And there were things that they loved. And like there were people they loved. They're, they probably loved fishing. And they just gave it up. Yeah, immediately they left their nets and followed him. We learn later in the gospel that these men, these same guys, they're far from perfect. But in this encounter, these imperfect men immediately followed Jesus. Their haste is the start of their discipleship. And although they would continue to stumble on their journey, and we can read about all of that, these imperfect, searching men were the ones Jesus called to be his disciples. These were like his most intimate friends. And we watch them fall and be just stupid for like four books of the Bible. But that's, that's kind of the crazy thing, that we're each called to be disciples, just like Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, John, all the apostles. And as you read through the Gospels, it's clear that people knew of Jesus. Lots of people gathered to hear from him, to hear him preach, or you know they waited among the crowd in hopes of catching a glimpse of him or in hopes that like, maybe he can heal whatever their ailment was or something. It would be hard to find somebody in the United States today who has never heard of Jesus. Like, everybody knows who Jesus is, but simply knowing of Jesus, knowing about him, does not make you a disciple. Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John immediately followed Jesus, even though they didn't know him very well. They did not have an intimate friendship with him and you know that they would later have, not at this moment. And yet they went with him. They spent time with him and got to know him. This is how all relationships begin, all friendships begin. Think about your best friend. You most likely did not become best friends at first sight, unless you met in kindergarten, because that's how kindergartners make friends. They're just like, hey, you're my best friend, and who knows how long that lasts. But it doesn't just happen at first sight like that. Like, deep friendships take time to form. We're also called to spend time with the Lord, like, especially through prayer. Prayer is spending time with the Lord, attending Mass spending time with the Lord. And so we put ourselves in the presence of the Lord. We're called to do that on a weekly basis at Mass, called to do that on a daily basis through prayer. A regular prayer life is one of the most essential elements of discipleship. Our discipleship has to begin with this time with the Lord. And as we get to know him more, we become more like him. Our hearts and our lives are like converted to be his own. And as the disciples got to know Jesus, they heard his teaching, so they asked him questions. And ultimately they had to decide if they believed him. And if they actually wanted to be friends with him. Some of Jesus' teachings were hard and the disciples had to accept them. But ultimately, like they believed in the truth that he spoke. There's, I should have written it down, there's the one verse in the Bible that just, it hits me every time uh, because Jesus shares like something really controversial, some, some controversial teaching. And it says that thousands walked away that day because he, he shared this controversial teaching, and then he said, you have to believe this to follow me. This is part of the deal. Actually, I know what it was. It's the institution of, of the Eucharist. He's like, you have to eat of my flesh to be a follower of me. And kind of understandably, 
thousands of people were like, hmm, that's a little much for me. And they got out of town. And they stopped following him. But the disciples stuck with it. They said, no, Jesus, I, I trust you. I believe in you. And I believe in your truth. The disciples continued to grow in their relationship with Jesus. They were no longer like following this stranger, but their intimate friend. The more Jesus taught them, the more they learned what it meant to love and worship God. And as we see in the Gospel of Mark, discipleship is not easy. The fishermen had to cast down their nets, had to drop everything. They had to leave their livelihood, their families, and everything they knew to follow Jesus. But Jesus left us the church and the sacraments to give us the strength and the courage to follow him in that same way. The sacrament of confirmation is a great tool that will help you live out your call of discipleship. The graces that we get from confirmation will allow you to know Jesus more deeply. Through the sacrament of confirmation, you'll be united more firmly to Christ, and your bond with the church will be more perfect, and your baptismal graces will be increased and deepened. And that's a lot of big words, but for example, with the sacrament of reconciliation, like, we know that. We're, we're like pretty familiar with confession, right? I know that all of you have done your first reconciliation. And that's, like, another great tool that the church gives us that we can frequent as much as we want. Mother Teresa went every single day. I just don't know what she could be confessing every single day because I guarantee you she was doing a better job than me. And... She went every single day. We're imperfect. Even St. Mother Teresa, even all of the disciples, just like the men Jesus called to follow him. But the sacrament of reconciliation allows us to confess our sins and be made new. Just as Simon Peter, Andrew, James, and John had, cast, had to cast down their nets, we too have to cast down our nets, our sins and our vices, so that we're able to truly be in the Lord's presence and become more like Him. The Mass is the greatest of all the tools that the Lord has given us to become His disciples. It's in the Mass that we receive our Lord in the Eucharist, in his body and blood. And as we consume him, body, blood, soul, and divinity, we're transformed into Christ himself. Like, we literally get to add Christ to us. That's just crazy. And therefore, like, obviously, that's going to be the most powerful thing we can do. So therefore, the Mass is the highest form of prayer. At the Mass, heaven reaches down to earth, and we're invited into the worship of God that's happening in heaven. Through the Mass, we also encounter the communion of the saints. I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, like, broken down, but these men and women, like the saints, were in heaven. By the way, everyone in heaven is a saint. Clarification in language. Um, but they're present with us during the liturgy. Like when Jesus called us to be his disciples, he doesn't expect us to all be exactly the same. That's why we have so many saints with so many different patronages, so many different journeys and lives and stories. We all are like, like filling this role of showing Christ to other people in a different and unique way. Like, you have a piece of Christ in you that no one else ever has or ever will. That's 
is so cool. You show a different piece of Christ than anyone else. That's so cool. And so during the Mass, the communion of saints like joins us. We get to experience this together. And we see that the call to be a disciple is not simply for one type of person. The saints are made up of a, a very diverse crowd. People of all races and nationalities, rich and poor. There are scholars like St. Thomas Aquinas. There are lawyers like St. Thomas More. There are teachers like St. John Bosco. But fathers and mothers like St. Uh, Louis and Marie Cell, Celi, Martin. Yes, thank you. I literally found them this week. Uh, there's there's saints Marie and Luigi. Hold on, Marie and Luigi or Maria and Luigi. Maria and Luigi? Are you kidding me? Mario and Luigi are saints. That's a whole thing. But it, it's a this beautiful married couple who are saints who raise saint children. Do you guys know Bosco sticks at school? Bosco sticks, it's like the best lunch. It's just the breaded cheese stick. Those are named after St. John Bosco. That's a true story. Literally, like the, the guy who invented those loved St. John Bosco, so he named them after them. I read that whole story on the way, like with my now husband when he was going to propose to me, because I kind of suspected it and he was really nervous, so we just read the whole history of Bosco sticks. It was a whole thing. But Bosco sticks are named after a saint. There, there's so many different saints. And God gives us all these different saints, and he gives all of them different gifts to live out their discipleship. As they became more, more like Christ, they became more fully who they were created to be. They more fully showed a different piece of Christ. And they were able to use their gifts to worship and glorify God in their own unique ways. So what does that mean to you right now? How do you start living out your call to discipleship? You know, just that sounds like just big, fancy, like church words. Well, first, I'm going to try to make this practical. First, you have to lay down your nets, just like the fishermen did in the story. What's stopping you from following Jesus? What sins are making it hard for you to respond to his call? What relationships in your life are preventing you from giving yourself to the Lord? These are your nets. And second, you have to make prayer a part of your daily life. You just have to. In order to hear the Lord's call, you have to quiet yourself and you have to listen. You can't hear what you're not listening for. And there are people who in their life, like, he's been trying to call out to them and they're just not listening. That's all of us. Every day he's trying to call out to us in different ways that we don't hear, that we don't listen to. So don't wait until he has to just smack you in the face with something crazy to make you listen. Make it much easier on yourself. Just start praying. Start listening. Spend time in prayer every day. Turn off your cell phone and sit in silence. I sound like a crazy person right now for saying that probably, but if you do that, your life is going to change. If you set aside 15 minutes at the end of every day or the start of every day where you don't have your phone on and you sit in silence, your life is literally going to change. It would be unrecognizable. And in that time, you can actually open and read your Bible or you can pray the rosary. The rosary is a great chance for you to sit in prayer when maybe you don't know what to say to God. That's also 
beautiful examples when we listen to like praise and worship music. That gives us words to say to God when sometimes we don't know what to say. That's why I play those songs because those are very powerful prayers and sometimes we can't come up with that ourselves, And that's totally fine. It doesn't matter what your prayer looks like as long as you put yourself in the presence of God. That's all it is. And as you commit to prayer, you'll come to know Jesus more intimately. You'll develop a greater understanding of his teachings. Learn to listen to what he says. Learn to recognize his voice in your daily life. And begin to see him not as just like this historical man, not just as an idea, but as a man who's still alive and still calling out to you, trying to talk to you specifically. Third, you have to frequent the sacraments. Use the graces that you've been given at your baptism. Keep going back and getting the sacrament and the graces of confession. Use the graces that you're going to be given at your confirmation. Keep going back and purifying your heart for confession. Receive the Eucharist. Receive Jesus as regularly as possible. That may even look like more than, one, more than once a week. I don't know if you guys know that. Mass happens every day before school, which I know you probably can't drive yet, so you don't have that option super. But our high school group, like we used to go every week together. And yeah, there's so much grace that you can get from the Mass. Challenge your parents. Ask your parents. Tell them that you want to go to Mass if you're not already going regularly. Technically, that's a requirement of confirmation, of being a part of this. Use that. Go with your families. And as you enter into prayer and all of these sacraments, you'll become more conformed to Christ, more like Christ which will allow you to love the people in your life more purely, to just be better, to feel more joy in your life. And it will allow you to love Jesus as he loved his Father. As you become conformed to Christ, you'll see the gifts that God has given you more clearly. They'll become more obvious to you. And you'll see how your uniqueness can allow you to glorify him in the only way, or in the way that only you can do. Whether it's serving him through school, or work, or sports, or art, or just in the way that you treat your family and friends. He made you specifically who you are, and he made you to be a disciple. He wants every single one of you to drop your nets and follow him so that you can be the disciple that you're meant to be. Amen? Amen.